Okay, um, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. So keeping within the theme of medicinal species use, but moving a bit away from rural communities into urban markets. Um, so in many countries, including South Africa, we, as Marula pointed out, there are many rural people utilizing indigenous wildlife as traditional medicine for both the healing of ailments and for symbolic purposes such as improving relationships and attaining good fortune. Um, previous figures published by the World Health Organization estimates that as much as 80% of the world's population relies primarily on animal and plant-based medicines. In South Africa in 2007, the trade was estimated to be worth 2.9 billion rand, supplying um, services to about 27 million consumers and sustaining about 130,000 livelihoods in the country. So South Africa has the unique situation where a large proportion of the population resides in former homelands, which are characterized by high um, High population densities, low level of income, low infrastructure and development, and a high reliance on natural resources from the surrounding rangelands. But um, for majority, um, sorry, the use of natural traditional medicine, however, is a lifestyle norm tied very closely to cultural values and traditions that have been practiced for thousands of years. So for many, of, for many people, traditional medicine is not considered a lesser alternative to Western medicines, but is seen as a necessary, um, but is seen as necessary to treat a range of illnesses that Western medicine is unable, unable to treat. Since the onset of democracy in 1994, we have seen increased migration from rural areas into urban cities, which has moved the demand from just rural areas into these urban areas. Urbanization, together with cash economies, have in some way effectively changed wildlife harvesting from being purely cultural, traditional, and subsistence activities that are part of the rural norm to being a subculture of frequently illegal activities located within these urban cash-based informal economies. Where we previously had specialized healers going out and collecting plants um, that they needed, we now have an influx of non-specialized um, harvesters over, responsible for over-harvesting and in some cases near extinction of many valued indigenous species. So this is... Um, a list of 60 plant species that are currently threatened by traditional use and proposed for tops. You can see that these are critically endangered species, such as Marula pointed out, Siphonochylus aethiopicus, or wild ginger, is in high demand in, medicinal, uh, in the medicinal trade and is known to treat, treat a range of illnesses. Um, it is mostly now extinct in most of its former ranges. Then we have endangered species. For example, the pepper bark or Wolbergia salutaris, which is known to be a relatively fast growing species, but because of the extent um, of over harvesting, it is also highly threatened. This begs the question what about long lived species, um, and what do we do about those if we can't protect robust species from over harvesting? Um, medicinal bulbs are also particularly vulnerable as they are destructively harvested in large quantities and they could face severe decline if, mo if uh, harvesting continues to go unmonitored and unchanged. Um, with regards to animals, not a lot of work has been done on the medicinal properties of animals, but animals are linked more closely for, um, or preferred more for their magical properties. For example, the skin of lion and leopard is known to depict strength to its owner, whereas um, parts such as pangolin scales and some of the lizard tails could be used as charms for protection against enemies, to strengthen relationships, and to attain good fortune. Vultures are known to be able to detect kills, and they are therefore prized for being able to to provide the user with clairvoyant powers, foresight, and increased intelligence. Apart from devastating loss of many species and um, the resultant impacts on ecosystems and their functioning, the benefits of livelihoods currently obtained from medicinal plants specifically will no longer be available in the next 15 to 30 years if we, if we continue at this rate. 
So in an attempt to prevent unsustainable utilization of wildlife, South Africa has a number of legislation, um, both nationally and internationally, for conservation. So we are party to CITES, as well as having the threatened or protected species regulations, um, to, in, to be able to identify species that are threatened by international trade or local harvesting and ensure that use is not detrimental to the species' survival in the wild. Specific bodies within government, in this case the scientific authority, are tasked with assisting with the regulations and restrictions of trade, and the, and including the monitoring of species. Historically, legislation has done little to curb the medicinal trade. Where they, we have an excess of legislation, but um, training and enforcement is often difficult and lacking. And because we are unable to enforce the laws, traders often see them as occupational hazards rather than effective deterrents. Um, one of the primary issues that law enforcers face is being able to identify the species in trade, especially because a large proportion of it is sold as parts and derivatives, for example, the barks of trees or the bones of animals. So essentially what we need is effective, easy ways to monitor this trade so that law enforcers can ensure um, that, our that they, they can implement the law and, and so that our conservation efforts are not failing. So in order to test whether this can be done, the study, a pilot survey was done at the Faraday market in Gauteng, which is a large uh, multi market, um, to identify the presence of any of the, th the proposed threatened or protected species in the markets, to develop a species guide that could help law enforcers, um, to provide lessons learned from um, from the, the study to develop a monitoring protocol for future and also to explore the perceptions of traders of, on laws and regulations, but I haven't yet got to the last, the last aim, objective. So for the species identification guide, I s talked to um, um, experts who have been working in the markets as well as da uh, been, uh, done desktop research and been looking through books to sort of put together a comprehensive guide that's easy to use so that law enforcers can easily use it. So this is just a few examples of what uh, of some of the species pages that's in the guide. And essentially, it's still, it's still a work in progress, but essentially what it is is um, so like a picture of what you would expect the species to look like in the market, along with like a description of like maybe shape, color, and size, as well as the most distinguishable, distinguishing characteristic of the plant that, so you wouldn't confuse it with something else. And then vernacular names. Um, this is also just another example. This, this species is easily distinguished by its yellow pigmentation, a critically endangered species. Um, and then also some of the pages contain look-alike species and trying to distinguish between common species and those that are threatened or protected. So for example, the clavia species, known to be traded highly, um, well, there's five clavia species on tops, currently, or proposed tops. Um, and you can see how similar it looks to common agapenthus species, which is also traded medicinally. So trying to find distinguishing characteristics by speaking to experts and just making it as comprehensive and easy as possible. Um, and then this is an example of Siphonochylus and what it looks like. And then the same thing was done for the animals. We tried to take pictures, but the traders unfortunately do not like you taking pictures of their merchandise. Um, so you steal a picture where you can. This was taken at Faraday. So, this is how, so essentially we want it to be as comprehensive, so what it looks like in the market so that law enforcers know when they see it. So this is what it looks like. There's actually two here. Um, and then snake skin, obviously, easy. And then um, this we actually took on our last visit. It's a leopard face vulture. So it's still a work in progress, like I said. So Faraday Market is the second largest multi market after the Durban Market, of course, and um, it is, but is the primary source of medicinal plants um, in Gauteng. It's a very busy market next to a taxi rink. There's people in and out all the time, and this is essentially what a typical stall looks like. There are over 162 traders with stalls that look like this, so you can imagine the enormity that law, uh, of the tasks in, that law enforcers face by being able to identify species when it looks like this here. 
Um, so what we did was we walked, a colleague and I went to the market in October, this is mid-October recently, um, and we sampled every stall, so we walked to, through every, trade, every stall and we um, wanted, um, and we, okay, so we greeted the traders obviously and asked them if we could have a look around and we recorded any, any species we could identify. We also tried to quantify it. It was a bit difficult for the plants, so we basically just grouped it into more than 20 parts or less than 20 parts. For the animals, it was easy to count individuals based on either if there was a whole skin or a skeleton or a skull. So preliminary results, we sampled 162 stalls. We were able to identify 30% of the proposed plant species and 54% of the proposed animal species. Um, this is the plant species, 18 of the plant species that we were able to identify. You can see that most of the traders had these two, Tremia um, and Moella. Both are protected currently on the threatened or protected species and they are bu both bulbs. Um, but what's interesting is still a high presence of critically endangered species. Siphonochylus, you can see in a lot of traders have it and in large amounts. Siphonochylus tubers are usually seven to eight centimeters, I think, and we were seeing bags of Siphonochylus that were two to three centimeters, which shows that either harvesters are just taking whatever they can get or they are not even giving populations time to recover. Then we also found some endangered species and of course your vulnerable species. Um, interesting to see, you can already see that most of the species, 14 out of the 18 species, naturally distributed in areas that are in Gauteng, KZN um, in particular. You can see only two species occur naturally in Gauteng, so it shows that most of the species at Faraday are coming from areas out of Gauteng. But the animals, um, the animal traders are more specialized, there aren't many of them, but the, those that are there are very uh, specialized in what they sell. Snake skin is very popular, but um, so southern python, a lot of traders had it, a common species. And of course you have your vultures, um, endangered. And then, so with your vultures, you have few traders selling them, but the few that have them, they're trading in large numbers. Um, so this is the number of individual species we were able to count. You can see, as I mentioned, a large number of vultures, what we identified as white-backed vultures. Um, snake skin again, and then sun gazers as well, highly prized for their ability to strengthen relationships. And of course, leopard species. Interesting, interestingly enough, all four of these species are listed on CITES. So if they aren't coming from South Africa, they could be coming across border and that's breaking international law as well. Um, so in summary, only 15% of the stalls were not trading in any top species or we couldn't identify any top species in those, in those stalls. So it is possible to monitor the trade, I think, but it does pose a lot of challenges and opportunities. So one of the challenges is that simple identification for certain species is just not that simple. Um, especially for like um, bark species where you need to actively, I guess, like interact with this, the species based on the smell or the taste or the texture to be able to tell what species it is. Um, also with look-alike species, it's, it's, it's quite easy to mix something um, for, for, like for something that's rare for a common species or something that's common for a rare species. Um, so you need to look more at that. But on the other hand, some species are really easily, um, easy to identify and we could use those species for conservation interventions so, uh, to see whether, they are, whether the interventions are working. Um, also with regards to age of the merchandise, um, so with animal bones and stuff, if you're doing monitoring in the markets over and over, you might think that a, um, a trader always has vulture, but it could be the same vultures that he's had for years. It's difficult to age it, so that could be an issue when it comes to, anim to monitoring the animals in the market. But with plants, it's an opportunity because you know when the plants are in season, so you could use this to monitor the presence of certain species at certain times. Um, also, you hear all these taboos about how the traders are so hostile and it's difficult to work with them. And I guess it is if they feel like you're tramping all over them and like 
Um, but I don't think we should go into these markets with a negative attitude. I think that there is an opportunity to work with them because these pieces are valuable to them. And I think that if we aim educational programs to um, further than just at law enforcers, we can actually achieve sustainable, we can come up with maybe sustainable ways of managing these species. Thank you.